So the idea is that how much we'll exchange for something is based on the value of one more unit, its marginal value. Um, and obviously, if you're on a boat in the ocean and you don't have enough drinking water to survive, you'd trade all your wealth, all your diamonds for another glass of water. But in current condition, we won't trade much for a glass of water. Uh, what happens is as we degrade ecosystems, um, you know, another, another resource that's absolutely critical is food. And to give it a good example, you know, we'd give all our money for uh, uh, enough food to uh, meet our needs for, uh, um, we'd give all our money for enough food to survive if we're going to starve without it. And yet we'll pay very little for an additional amount of food today to the point where global agriculture is only worth 3% of our GNP. However, if our climate becomes unstable, we've had this unusual period of 10,000 years of really stable climates, which coincides with agriculture. We couldn't develop agriculture until we got stable climates. So there's a, there's a threat now that if we lose climate stability, we'll lose agriculture. So what's the marginal value of climate stability? When we're producing enough food, food is not worth very much. As soon as we produce a tiny bit less food, where we're not meeting our basic needs, food becomes immensely valuable. So there's an enormous challenge to figuring out how much these things are worth. Um, so I would actually argue that what we need to focus on is not trying to put dollar values on anything which can fluctuate wildly. We saw in 2008 when food supplies diminished, or it's 2007, when global food supplies diminished a little bit, the price tripled. What we really need to focus on is how much of these things like ecosystem services and how much food and how much water is required to meet our basic needs. And we've got to say, well, that's a non-negotiable limit. That much has to be provided. So once we've decided that, we decide how much forest we need to regulate and purify our water. And then, then we can let the market decide what the value of the extra trees that we can cut down is worth. But we can't let the market decide what the value of the trees is and then that allow that to determine our water supply. So how much waste can the atmosphere absorb um, in terms of carbon dioxide? Well, we have good science that tells us how much it can absorb without destabilizing agriculture. Let's set that limit and then if people want to decide how to, who gets the right to spew waste, we can allow the market to determine that. Um, so that would be ecological limits determine prices rather than prices determining ecological limits, if that makes sense. That does make sense, but who actually gets to work within, consume or emit within the sustainable limit? Right. And th this is the trick. So the way it works right now, a lot of economists say, well, let's just do this like we do everything else. Whoever's willing to pay the most for the right to chop down a tree, take out a fish, or, um, or pollute the atmosphere gets the right to do it. The problem with this is this is an economic way of making decisions based on one dollar, one vote. So we can take examples of, um, you know, we use this all the time, even for food. So we look again, 2007, where uh, energy prices were going very, very high. So we decided to convert corn into ethanol. And Americans and Canadians have very, very high purchasing power. So we could pay more for corn converted to ethanol then Mexicans could pay for corn converted to tortillas to feed their families. So we had kids going hungry in Mexico while Americans were driving around in their big SUVs because we were allowing the market to make the decision of who got to consume the corn. And uh, so market decisions are based on one dollar, one vote. I personally don't think that's always an appropriate way to make decisions for resources that are essential and have no substitutes like food, water, ecosystem services. However, we make so many decisions that way. We do make decisions that way about food. A lot of, mark, a lot of economists are, are in favor of making decisions that way about, um, for example, who would get to use the waste absorption capacity for carbon dioxide. And this is what Coyota Protocol is trying to do, develop tradable permits. Um, and there are amazing efficiencies in the market. You know, it's uh, voluntary decisions, free choice. Um, and I'm comfortable making that type of decision for... Um, uses above and beyond basic needs. I'm not comfortable with using one dollar, one vote for determining how basic needs are met. However, currently where nobody pays is the worst situation, where people dump their waste into the atmosphere, dump their waste in the ocean, or chop down forests, wiping out cities' water supplies, and pay nothing for that. That's absolutely the worst. We need some kind of signal saying you can't do that. We need market mechanisms are one way of providing that signal. Um, often I'm in favor of 
you know, perhaps having democratic decisions deciding how much of that forested watershed needs to be preserved to provide for a high quality of life in this city, to provide a drinking water, to provide uh, recreational uses, to provide a nice habitat for biodiversity. Maybe that should be determined democratically. Then once that decision is made, allow markets to decide who gets to chop down the trees um, and who gets the money from doing so. Josh, we've talked about some of the policy decisions that would have to be thought through as we consider the environmental cost of capital. What are some of the other policy things that are on your mind? The problem with the market mechanism is markets really only work for resources that you can own. If I can't own something, I can't buy it and I, I, I can't sell it. If I had a store that you could walk in and take whatever you wanted without paying me because there was no law saying the stuff was mine, you wouldn't pay me and I wouldn't have a store there to provide those things. So markets only work when you can own things. And you can't really own um, a stable climate. You can't own the ozone layer. You can't own uh, the capacity of an ecosystem to regulate floods or the capacity of wetlands to prevent uh, hurricane damage. Um, when you can't own these things, markets don't work for them. And we have to figure out a way to get around that. Um, uh, there's another big issue with markets is that markets are about the allocation of scarce resources. But a scarce resource, if I use it, there's less left for you. That means it's scarce. But a lot of resources aren't scarce. If I live uh, behind a barrier island that protects me from a hurricane damage and you're my neighbor, my benefit from that protection doesn't leave less from you. If I benefit from a stable climate, it doesn't leave less for you. So um, the value of these services is not the value to one individual, they're the value to all of us. And markets, function on a price mechanism. They charge you, you know, you, uh, we ration the use of resources by using prices. To give it a concrete example of how this works and how it fails is uh, take a look at, I mentioned before, ozone depletion. Most people say we've solved the ozone problem, that we are no longer degrading the ozone. So under the Montreal Protocol, this was a, a, um, something that limited the use of chlorofluorocarbons and other ozone depleting compounds. However, it didn't prevent the use. It allowed India and China to continue to uh, produce and use, um, I guess they're called halo fluorocarbons, um, which are only about 5% as bad as chlorofluorocarbons and depleting the ozone. But China and India are increasing the rate of use by 35% per year. So in 2006, we had the worst hole in the ozone layer in history. And the reason for this, we actually have non-ozone depleting compounds. But the knowledge for how to make these is patented. So we use the price mechanism to decide who gets to use that knowledge. The fact is that knowledge, no matter how much it's used, doesn't wear out. Yet we ration use with a price mechanism that basically makes it too expensive for India and China to use. They therefore continue to use the cheaper ozone depleting technologies and we wipe out the ozone layer. So it doesn't make sense to ration knowledge that's needed to save the planet using the price mechanism. Because knowledge has this characteristic that it doesn't wear out through use. It's not scarce. So first of all, economies can't ration the use of resources it can't own. So the ozone layer itself can't be owned. We can't really ration use of that. Second, it shouldn't ration use of resources that don't wear out through use. And that's one thing is the ozone layer doesn't wear out through use, no matter how much I benefit from a uh, UV protection doesn't leave any less for you, um, but we can't ration that anyway. But the knowledge on how to create compounds that don't destroy the ozone layer never wears out through use, and yet when we use the price mechanism to ration it, it perversely allows fewer people to use that, and we end up destroying the ozone layer. The same would be true if we ration new technologies that are carbon-free energies, for example, or any environmentally friendly technology. So basically, markets uh, failed um, work with certain resources, and most ecosystem services you can't privately own, and most don't wear out through use. So markets are an ineffective way for deciding how to use environmental services. The third issue I would have to say is that, um, as I mentioned before, economic decision rules are not democratic. Deciding how much natural resources to use based on markets is one dollar, one vote. Whoever has the money gets the say. And yet a lot of these natural resources are a shared inheritance of mankind. We might prefer more democratic decisions for, for um, figuring out who gets to use them.